Hi friends, welcome to my backyard in beautiful Wisconsin. My name is Mark Shack, and I'm with M&M Cage Company. Today, I'd like to talk about artificial lighting and how it affects pet birds. Now, if you're confused about what light is best for your bird, trust me, you are not alone. Even if you were to study the known scientifically proven facts about the subject, it would be a very complicated subject alone. Now, once you add in all the false information generated by unscrupulous lighting manufacturers, highly uneducated avian vets, and internet experts who know absolutely nothing, a complicated subject becomes almost impossible to understand. Hopefully, after you see the information I'm about to show you, some of that confusion is going to go away. At the very least, you're going to learn the difference between what is true and what is proven versus what is marketing hype and rumors and false information that's been flying around the internet for years, maybe even decades. The current trend is for the experts to tell you that you need to buy a light that simulates natural sunlight. That guy up there. They focus mainly on UVB and how UVB synthesizes vitamin D3 once it's absorbed through the skin. Claiming that you can't possibly have a healthy bird without one of these lights that brings that guy inside. Unfortunately, 90% of what they say in these scholarly sounding articles is absolutely true. But it's copy-paste information that's been known from scientists since the 1940s. And it mostly applies to human beings. Now there's a couple studies out there that were done on birds, and we're gonna talk about those later. But these articles, they throw a lot of buzzwords around, like full spectrum, 5600K, CRI, UVA, UVB, and they all sound the same, and they all end the same. They end by saying, so, you need to go out and buy one of these lights that brings that fella into your house. Unfortunately, they might not even know this, but that light does not exist. There is no artificial light that simulates the natural sun because it's beyond the laws of physics to turn electricity into anything that can simulate the sun. After you see the information that I'm about to present to you, you will clearly see how ridiculous that statement is. So now comes the part of the video where we start looking at the science behind light and how it affects living organisms. Yeah, it's a little dry, it's geeky science stuff, but if you stay with it, you're gonna learn some really cool stuff. Before we can understand how light affects living organisms, we need to understand how light works. The world around us is filled with electromagnetic waves, sometimes referred to as simply waves, sometimes referred to as radiation. We will be referring to them as EM waves. There are hundreds, sometimes thousands of EM waves passing through the very room you are sitting in right now. Some are passing through you and some are bouncing off of you. It's very important to remember that it is the length of an EM wave that controls how it functions and what its actions are on living organisms. Wavelengths are measured from peak to peak. 
And as we can see from this illustration, the longest EM waves are radio waves. They can be anywhere from 300 yards from peak to peak to one yard from peak to peak. When EM waves drop down to the length of a bumblebee, it turns into what we call microwaves. Longer microwaves are used for communication, but when they shorten to the length of a pinhead, the microwaves are used to cook our food. This is a good illustration to show you how different EM lengths behave within a small change of their length. It goes from waves that are communication waves down to pretty dangerous EM waves that would actually kill living organisms, changing from the size of a bee to the size of a pinhead. When wavelengths fall into this length here, they become visible light. These are the only EM waves that we can actually see, and actually, they're the reason that we can see. As they get a little smaller, they turn into ultraviolet light, and then they turn into x-rays, and then they turn into some very nasty radiation, the kind of radiation that'll melt the flesh off of your bones. Most EM waves are produced by humans, but the ones in this range are produced by the sun. And because the subject of this video is about sunlight, these will be the only EM waves that we'll be talking about. The longest EM waves that the sun produces we can't see, but we can sure feel. They are infrared waves, also known as heat. When the wavelength produced by the sun gets below 700 nanometers and above 400 nanometers, they become visible light. Below 400 nanometers, they become ultraviolet light, which we humans cannot see. Scientists have divided ultraviolet light into three categories, and they do this because even though they are in the ultraviolet spectrum, the effect they have on living organisms is very different. As the presentation goes on, we'll talk about the visible light spectrum, UVA, and UVB. We don't have to talk about UVC because 100% of UVC is filtered out by the atmosphere. This is a good thing because UVC will disintegrate the cells of living organisms. Now we're going to talk about the visible light spectrum in detail. If you remember, the visible light spectrum are EM waves between 700 and 400 nanometers. These are the wavelengths that the human eye can see. These are the wavelengths that allow us to see. Light works by bouncing off of objects and to our eye. As the wavelength changes within the visible spectrum, the color it produces changes. So when we look at a red shirt, it looks red to our eye because there are wavelengths in the light that's hitting it in the red spectrum. And that bounces off the shirt and to our eye, and we see red. The blue pants we see is blue because in the light, there are wavelengths present that are in the blue light spectrum. They bounce off the object and to our eye, and we see blue. The other wavelengths that are present in this light, which are not red or blue, don't bounce off into our eyes. They're absorbed by the object. So we don't see yellow, we don't see green, we don't see purple. Now, if this particular light did not contain wavelengths in the red spectrum and the blue spectrum, the clothes would look some other color. And what that other color would be would be completely dependent on which of these wavelengths were present. If you remember back to your childhood days and you used to play with black lights, you would go into a room and you would shut the lights off and you would turn the black light on 
and everything you looked at looked really funny. Some things glowed, but nothing looked normal. That's because the light present in the black light was only in the violet spectrum. So anything red didn't look red because the red spectrum wasn't there. Only the violet spectrum was there. Now, there are a limited amount of colors in the visible light spectrum, but when those colors are mixed, they produce different colors. Exactly the same way as if you were to mix different colors of paint together, the resultant color of the paint will be a different shade depending on which colors you put in and how much of each color that you put in. If you were to mix every wavelength in equal amounts, the resulting color would be white. But a light is rarely white and almost never contains every wavelength. Therefore, the mix of wavelengths that are present create a final color. And that final color is measured on the Calvin scale. This is where the K comes from when defining a light bulb's color. If you look at any light bulb online or in the store, somewhere on the package, it's going to tell you the light color with a number like 3500K or 5600K. As you can see from this illustration, 1000K is more of an orangish color, and as the higher the number goes, the color changes and changes until it gets very blue. Normal household bulbs are around 3500K. They have that yellowish tint to it. More and more, there's more lights available that are called daylight bulbs, and they are above 5000K. But the thing to remember about this illustration is that it represents the final color of the light after all of the wavelengths present are mixed together. That's why the measurement is not in nanometers, but in Calvin or K. The color of light can be measured by an instrument called an optical spectroscope. The optical spectroscope produces a report like this one here. These numbers on the left can be quite confusing, and we're not going to talk about them. But here you can see that this light is around 6500K, and the CRI is around 94. But what I want you to pay attention to is this graphic illustration here on the right, because we're going to be looking at a lot of these reports, and I want you to understand what they mean. This basically represents the individual wavelengths that are present in this particular light and the intensity that they are present at. So these numbers down here, you remember, these are nanometers. This is the visible spectrum. And you remember that each wavelength has a different color. This scale is the intensity. So at 730 nanometers, there's not a lot of that color in this light, so forth, until it gets up to here, where there's a lot of blue in this light. The important thing to remember about this graph is that you remember from a previous slide that an object will only appear to our eyes as its natural color if the light that's hitting it has the wavelength of that object's color. Therefore, a light with more wavelengths present is going to make objects that it lights up look more natural. We've covered a lot of information, so let's take a little bit of time to do a short recap. Remember this slide? This represents the EM waves produced by the sun. We know what infrared is, that's heat. We know UVC we can ignore because it's filtered out by the atmosphere. And we just learned what the visible spectrum is. It's the light we can see. It's the light that controls the colors we see. Now in the next section, we're gonna talk about UVA. We learned that EM waves in the visible spectrum bounce off of objects. 
and their reflection is picked up by our eyes and enable us to see color. But UV wavelengths act a little bit different. While they do bounce off most objects, there are some objects that they actually penetrate. One of them is skin. UVA penetrates the skin the deepest, all the way down to the hypodermis. Now, as a note, UVB and UVA do not penetrate feathers. So in a bird, the only skin that UV is going to affect are their legs, their feet, and in birds like African greys that have that large skin patch around their eyes. Other than that, the UV will not go through their feathers and penetrate their skin. The effect that UVA has on skin is it causes it to tan. When UVA penetrates the skin, it produces something called melanin, and melanin is what causes skin to tan. The benefit of tan skin is a higher resistance to UV. We also know, and we hear it all the time, that too much exposure to UVA over time causes skin to prematurely wrinkle. Now, this information relates to human skin. There is no study that I know of that tests if a bird's legs get tan when exposed to UVA or if it prematurely wrinkles if they are exposed to it a lot. We do know, however, that UVA affects birds' eyes much differently than ours. Birds can actually see UVA waves while we can't. We humans view the world in around one million colors. Birds are able to see around 100 million colors. Now, experts can only guess at how that changes the behavior of birds, but we do know that there is no measurable health benefit to birds from UVA, despite what unscrupulous bird light manufacturers will tell you. There is no scientific proof that UVA has any effect on the health of a bird. The thoughts from the experts are that being able to see a hundred million colors helps birds identify their food a lot easier and identify each other easier. Now we move to the last subject, UVB. Once again, UVB penetrates the skin, but not the feathers. UVB only penetrates to the epidermis. We know that UVB synthesizers produce vitamin D3 in humans and some other living organisms. We also know that UVB is what causes sunburn and overexposure to UV can cause skin cancer. Just like UVA, this information is related to human beings, and we don't know if UVB can burn the skin of birds or cause skin cancer if they are overexposed to it. However, the way UVB affects birds' eyes is very significant. In a study published by the Royal Society of Biological Sciences, a team of scientists studied a number of species of parrots that are commonly kept as pets. They found that these parents possess what they call UV-sensitive visual pigments, or UVS. What this means is that these birds' eyes are highly sensitive to UVB rays, and overexposure causes cataracts, macular degeneration, and blindness. Now that we've learned some basic information about the science of EM waves caused by the sun, and we've been introduced into each one of these categories, a little bit of how they affect living organisms, it's time to talk about artificial lights. Mainly, what we're going to talk about are the claims being made by light manufacturers and how they compare to science and how they compare to the truth. 
The first group of wavelengths we're going to talk about is the visible spectrum. The first thing we're going to talk about is the phrase full spectrum. Anybody who has spent more than five minutes researching lighting for birds has heard the phrase full spectrum. And almost every bird lover has it etched into their brain that if a light is not full spectrum, then it's bad for a bird. And that any light purchased for a bird absolutely has to be full spectrum. Unfortunately, the truth is the phrase full spectrum means nothing. It's a marketing term that has no scientific definition, therefore it can't be measured. So a full spectrum light can be any light. A couple of summers ago, I was driving down the road and I saw a truck pulling a trailer. And on the side of that trailer was painted these words, full spectrum lawn care. And I had to laugh. Think about what that phrase, full spectrum lawn care, could mean. Well, that could mean anything. And it's the same with lights. Because there is no official definition of full spectrum light, could be anything, just like a landscaper could do anything and claim it to be full spectrum. I call my lights full spectrum because this word is so ingrained into the brains of bird people that I would never sell a light if I didn't call it full spectrum. And it'll probably remain that way forever. One more quick story. Last spring, I overheard my 34-year-old neighbor yelling at her son, get back in the house and put a hat on or you're going to catch a cold. Well, we've known since the 40s how you catch a cold. And it's not by not wearing a hat in a cold, drizzly weather. It comes by catching a virus. But I will bet you that mothers will yell that phrase at their little boys as long as there are mothers living on this earth. And I'm afraid it will be the same case with the word full spectrum. As long as there are bird owners on this earth, they are going to insist that their light for their bird must be full spectrum. Now, let's look at the facts and the truth. Remember how we learned about reading spectrographs a few slides ago and how these graphs show the amount of EM waves that are present in a light and their intensity? Well, this is where that knowledge is going to come to use. Decades ago, when people started really pushing the full spectrum lamps, people who know better knew it was a bunch of malarkey. So there was some third party testing labs that started testing lamps that were claiming to be full spectrum and publishing the results. And this is just one sample from many, all right? On the left, this is a spectrograph of the sun at noon on a cloudless day. And it is fabulous. Look at how many EM waves are present and look at their intensities. It's crazy. Now, the reason you see this drop off here is because this is where you're starting to get into ultraviolet light and a spectrometer will not measure UV. So that's why you see this dropping off. All right. So when the phrase full spectrum was coined, this was kind of what it was referring to. All light waves present. All right. Now, let's look at reality. Here's a graph of a claimed full spectrum lamp and a fluorescent lamp not marketed as full spectrum. The solid blue line was not claimed to be full spectrum cost about six bucks. Now this was 20 years ago. The dotted line is a lamp that claimed to be full spectrum. A little more than double. As you can see, they're the same thing. It's what everybody knows. I say it over and over and over again. It is beyond the laws of physics to turn electricity into 
anything that simulates sunlight. And when you hear all the manufacturers say that their light does simulate natural sunlight, I'm sorry. We've known for over 20 years, and people who know better have proven that that simply is not true. Here's another spectrograph that isn't quite as colorful, but it illustrates the same thing. The dark blue line is showing the sun, and this will be at noon on a cloudless day. This will be a claimed full spectrum T12. That's a fluorescent, you know, a long tube, the fluorescent bulb. You can see how it really does compare to the sun. This is a claimed full spectrum incandescent light, which this is a 20 year old graph. Um, I'm not even sure you can buy full spectrum incandescence anymore, but I'm going to show you a CFL lamp chart a little later, but you'll see the same thing is true. Here is what it looked like. Nothing like the sun and it spikes way up in the blue area up here, but nothing special about this bulb. This is a bulb that is marketed for birds. It claims to be full spectrum, and it makes a lot of pretty bold claims about how healthy it's going to cause your bird to be. It also advertises it as UVA and UVB, but when I measured it, there was no UV output. And as you can see from the visible spectrum, it's far from the sun. Now, this is just an illustration of a comparison of what we as consumers are being told simulates natural sunlight versus natural sunlight. As you can see, the claim is a bit of a stretch. The other problem with claiming that your bird needs 5600K to be healthy because that's what the sun is, well, that's not true. The sun is only 5600K at noon on a sunny day. This fun little graph here is showing the change of the light's color spectrum from morning till night. It's a little confusing and it's moving a little fast, but watch these numbers. It goes from 1000K to yeah, about 30,000K. This is morning, and this is night. So if we had the ability to stop this right around noon, it would be around 5,600K. So you tell me your light simulates natural sunlight? Okay, make it do this, and maybe then I'll start believing you. Now, is it important for a bird's health to have this change? during the day? Well, there's nothing that proves that to be true. The point of this illustration is the ridiculous notion that an artificial light can be like the sun. Next, let's talk about UVA and UVB in artificial lights. A little while ago, I purchased a number of bulbs off of Amazon, and each one of these bulbs were advertised for birds, they were advertised that they produced UVA and UVB, and of course, they made a lot of claims about health benefits that their bulb would have for your birds. The reason I bought them was to use my UVA and UVB meter to see just how much UV these lights really had. Now, the entire video can still be found on YouTube called Full Spectrum Myth Revealed. But for this video, we're just going to show a shortened version of it. Through the magic of fast forwarding, you see me opening and installing each bulb. Now, 
you can see me measuring the output of UVA and UVB with my meter. And as you can see, there is no UVB present. In bulb number one or in bulb number two. The last bulb was the Home Depot bulb. And as you would expect, it doesn't contain any UVA or UVB either. The bottom line is that there are a number of manufacturers who are just selling standard $2 bulbs and claiming that they have something special that your birds need. This next light I'm going to show you actually did have UVA and UVB in it. And as you can see from the meter, it's registering an output. Now, do we know how much is UVA and how much is UVB? Yes, we do. UVB does not go through glass while UVA does. So, with a simple little UVB filter, you can see that about half of that output, or a little more, is UVB. Now, if your attention is drifting at this point in the video, I'm going to ask you to wake up and listen to this, because this is the, one of the most important things you're going to get from this video. What this bulb is, is a repackaged reptile bulb. And your bird is not a reptile. Imagine what would happen if your bird sat in the middle of a desert on a flat rock in the sun all day. They'd be dead, right? Birds are not reptiles. Birds' eyes are sensitive to UVB. The point I am making is never, ever, ever put a UVB light bulb, a reptile bulb especially, or a UVB for bird light bulb over your parent. It will cause cataracts and it will cause blindness. So please avoid that. Now, the reason that manufacturers can get away with what they're doing is when you read the instructions, it'll tell you that you got to keep the bulb 18 inches away from the bird. All right, well, here I am starting at 18 inches. It's out of frame, but you can see it's. It's zero, zero, zero. You know, at about eight inches away, it's starting to pick up the UV. They tell you to keep it 18 inches away. I'm hoping because they know that it's bad for them to actually have UVB. But at 18 inches away, you're back to the $2 light bulb. It's not, it's not doing anything at 18 inches away. Down in the shop, we learned a lot of interesting things about the amount of UV produced by the bulbs that claim to be full spectrum. So it's only appropriate that now we come out into the natural environment. Now two of the bulbs we looked at, we noticed didn't put any UV out until we almost touched them with the meter and then they put out 0.1. The other bulb did put out UV. It didn't put out any. It had zero at the recommended distance. Um, once we moved it in to eight inches away, which is half the recommended distance, we had one. About three inches away, we had 0.6. Well, now, those numbers don't mean anything to you. So that's why we came out here to kind of compare those numbers with what is in the natural environment. So, with the same nifty little meter here, 
and the sun is over in that direction. So, we are going to see what the sun puts out. I'm going to walk up so you can read it. Right now, it's putting out approximately 2.2 to 2.4. Now, this is versus the point 0.1. This is 2.4. So is it safe to assume that in the natural environment that um, birds receive 2.2 milliwatts per square centimeter UV? Absolutely not. That could be the furthest from the truth. The amount of UV that actually reaches the surface of the planet, um, it changes by many, many factors. Time of day, um, amount of clouds, UV doesn't go through clouds, UVB doesn't go through clouds at all, only a little bit of UVA. So you got cloud cover, you got time of day, you got time of year, and you got location on the Earth. The closer you are to the equator, the more UV there is. We're in Wisconsin at the end of November, so this 2.4 is gonna be about as low on a sunny day like today. The other thing is, when we start talking about natural environment, every one of your birds is gonna have a different natural environment, a different amount of UV in its natural environment. Some of the smaller Amazon parrots live most of their lives under the canopy, which no UVB penetrates. Uh, you know, some birds are in the sun and out of the sun. Uh, the grassland finches, um, they're in the sun all day. And there again, depending on which part of the world your bird is from, they're going to receive a different amount of UV. Now, rest assured, none of your birds are from Wisconsin. And none are from latitudes this, this far north. So, this 2.4 um, is... is ridiculously low, but I wanted you to see how even a ridiculously low number is so much higher than these lamps that claim to be natural environment. Now there's a really good chance that what I just told you is really confusing you because down in the shop, the artificial lights were putting out 0.4 readings on the meter and I telling you that that's going to blind your parrot. And then I go outside and the readings are over 2.4 and I'm saying that's ridiculously low. So what is it? What it is, is it's the amount of time in a day that the bird is exposed to UV. In the wild, they're exposed to it two, maybe four hours some days none, um, sometimes many months of the year, it's none. So as far as time of exposure goes, it's very little. Now you buy an artificial lamp and you put it over your parrot and 365 days a year, he's going to get 10 hours exposure to the UV. So that's the big difference. It's not necessarily the intensity, it is the exposure time that's dangerous. That concludes the portion of this video that talks about the false claims that artificial light manufacturers say about the health benefits of their bulbs. Now, let's talk about the true benefits that artificial light provides. The number one benefit for artificial lighting is that you get to control how many hours of light a bird receives in a day. The fancy word for that is photoperiod. Why is that important? Well, many of a bird's hormones are triggered by photoperiod. These hormones then trigger the bird's behaviors. Actually, it's not just pet birds that are affected by photoperiod, it's a lot of nature's animals. When you see birds migrating, 
most of the time, it isn't because of the temperature changing. It's because the days are shortening or lengthening. The same thing is true for bucks going into rut in the fall and male turkeys strutting for females in the spring. While logic may cause you to believe that birds in the wild start building their nests in the spring because it got warmer and they know that there are some insect hatches about to happen, well, that's not true. If that were true, that would mean that birds have the ability to rationalize, and they don't. Not all behavior is, but much of a bird's behavior is caused by photoperiod. I'm not an expert on this subject. I'm just an engineer. So here is a quote from Dr. Fern Van Sant. From the four birds, she's a veterinarian at the four birds in San Jose, California. If there is one single positive change that a pet bird owner can make, it's returning the bird to a regularly reoccurring photo period. Whether in the wild or in captivity, most birds demonstrate a remarkable periodic periodicity to their days. Restoration of regular reoccurring day and night cycle usually results in a happier and healthier companion bird. Birds have in their brains a finely tuned, light-sensitive pineal gland. This gland is likely the mechanism by which birds set their circadian rhythm. This is why on my lights, I don't have an on and off switch on them, because the intention is to plug them into a lamp timer so the bird gets a consistent amount of light each day. The other important aspect of providing pet birds with artificial light is quite simply that birds love light. I mean, really love light. If your bird's only source of light is from a window across the room or from an overhead light, then cage bars, play tops, and toys block a lot of that light. I designed M&M lights to mount on top of or inside of the bird's cage and focus all of the light down into the cage. Here's a before and after photo of a customer's cage with the lights on and off. Now, if you were living in this cage, what would you prefer? This particular cage happens to be right next to a full-length glass door on a south-facing wall. And you can see how <laughs> there's a little more light over here, but really, it's hard to get light inside of a cage unless the light is inside of the cage. My lights also have a proprietary blend of LEDs that provide way more wavelengths in the visible spectrum than any other light on the market. And while no scientific studies have been made to prove any benefits of my light, thousands of happy customers and weekly feedback about the positive effects of customers' birds compels me to think that they do have a benefit. Welcome back to my yard. I didn't think that guy was ever going to stop talking. Hope you enjoyed the presentation and I hope you learned a lot. Three things I want to leave you with. Provide your bird with lots of light and he was going to love you for it. Put that light on a timer because consistent photo period is the best thing you can do for your bird. Third and most important, please, please do not put a reptile bulb above your bird. Their eyes are way too sensitive to UVB and it's not needed. You provide them with a good diet, good consistent photo period, and you will have not have to feel guilty about not being a good bird parent. So. 
that's it for the video. Have a great day. Best of luck with your bird children.